Good evening and welcome to the Station Inn. Thank you. Tonight we're here to do a live album with Mike Snyder, and we appreciate every one of you coming out, and we want you to have a good time and enjoy yourself. And you're really going to like Mike. If you like good bluegrass music and country humor, you'll love him. He's from a small town called uh, Gleason, Tennessee. I tried to call him one time and got a hold of Jackie Gleason in Florida. The town is so small that they don't have a zip code, but Mike has one. That's how popular he is. And if there's any record executives in the audience... Mike does not want you to look at him like another artist. He don't, he don't want a major deal. He sold a million records out of the back of his car, so he doesn't need your help. All he wants you to do is sit back, relax, and enjoy it. Let's give a big hand for Mike Snyder. <laughs> hey. Well, it's sure good to be here tonight. I appreciate all y'all coming. Sweetie couldn't be here tonight. She's down there in the lawnmower factory, and she's still making us a living. But she told me to tell all y'all, hello. Well, I'm from a small town, Gleason. That's over in West Tennessee. And it ain't too big, but I sure do love living there. Gleason is a pretty small town down there at the four-way stop. There ain't but two ways it'll go anywhere. <laughs> the houses, they all so far apart. Everybody's got their own tomcat. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only place I've ever been in my life where you can get on the telephone and get the wrong number and talk for 15 minutes. <laughs> We raise a few sweet taters around Gleason and raise a few hogs and got a little clay mining going on. 
But really about the only big industry we got is a 400-pound Avon lady. <laughs> The name of this song is, I, I named it after my hometown, Tater Town. It's called the Tater Town Special. Y'all ready, boys? You may not know it, but beside picking the banjo, I raise hogs. Me and my daddy and my brothers got about 800 hogs out there. So there's a whole lot of rooting going on. <laughs> Having so many, we have to go to market about once a week or once every two weeks. And last Saturday, we hauled a load off up there to McKenzie to the stock barn, and we got them unloaded, and daddy got the check and come on back home. Well, after we got home, he got to looking at the check, and he could see that they had shorted him $20. Well, a hair come up on the back of his neck like an old mad dog. He jumped in the truck and run on back up there to the stock barn. Got out of the truck and ran in there, went up to the window, and said, Ma'am, y'all have shorted me $20 on my hog check. She said, Well, Mr. Snyder, the reason we done that is because last week when you brought a load of hogs up here, we overpaid you twenty dollars. Daddy said, "Oh." <laughs> she said, "By the way, last week when we overpaid you, you didn't come running back up here complaining." Daddy said, "Well, no. I can overlook an occasional mistake. <laughs> Two in a row is just more than I can stand." <laughs> Has any of y'all ever milked any cows? 
you have? I, I have two. Back when I was in the fifth grade, I milked 15 Holstein cows. And I want y'all to know that anybody that thinks cows give milk just ain't never milked a cow. <laughs> you have to utterly take it from them. <laughs> cows are trouble, especially when they're trying to have a calf. One day this old cow's out laying on the side of the pasture right out there by the side of the road and she's trying to have her calf and what happened, the calf was breached. That means he was turned around backwards and he just wasn't having no luck coming out. So me and Daddy was trying to help this cow have a calf and we wallowed around there about an hour and a half and about all we could get done was get his back legs started out real good, you know. And we kept put tugging and pulling and about that time his car come up. This big old fella got out, he's about six foot three. Had arms on him like a prize fighter. He said, boys, I'm from Memphis. I'm a long ways from home and I'm lost. He said, I'm trying to find the college down there. So we told him how to get to the college. He said, by the way, what are y'all doing? I said, well, we're trying to pull this calf out of this cow. He said, well, can I help? I said, sure, give it a try. So he sat down there and propped both feet up on that old cow and grabbed that calf by the feet and let out a growl and pulled that calf right out. He got up and Daddy said, Son, we sure do thank you. Can we pay you anything? He said, No, but you can answer me one question. I want to know how fast was that calf running when he hit that cow. <laughs> I told him about 70 mile an hour. <laughs> this next song we're going to do for you is called A Little Rock Getaway. closest friends in school was Lernie Whitefield. 
And I caught up with Larney in the second grade, and he done been there two terms when I got there. <laughs> Them two terms was Johnson's and Nixon's. <laughs> People claimed that Larney's bread wasn't all done. <laughs> teacher asked him one day, she said, Larney, how much is one-tenth of one percent? He said, I don't know, but it couldn't be much. <laughs> She said, well, if you had 10 flies on your back and you mashed one, how many would be left? Larney said, one, the one I mashed. <laughs> Larney wasn't all dumb. His mama thought that the reason in his grades was so bad in school is because he probably couldn't see the blackboard. So she carried him to the eye doctor. The eye doctor set him up on the examining table and said, Larney, I want you to put your hand over your right eye and read that chart back there on the wall. So Larney said, 38229. <laughs> doctor said, no, that ain't right. Larney, put your hand over your right eye. He said, 38229. <laughs> no. The doctor said, just hold on, son. He went back in the back room, got a brown paper bag, and cut a hole in it about the size of a silver dollar, come back out and slipped it over Larney's head and said, Now, son, read the chart. He started sniffling and whining and squalling. His mother said, Son, what's wrong with you now? He said, Mama, I was hoping for wire rims. <laughs> That's corny, ain't it? Well, I appreciate the laugh. <laughs> All right. We're going to do another one for you called Lady of Spain. Hello, Mill. Come on in. We just in here having a big time.
Appreciate it. When I was little and growing up, one thing Mama always made us do was go to church. And I'd just about soon be whipped with a peach tree limb when I was little and have to go to church. But as I got older and growed up, I found out that was the right thing to do because you can learn a whole lot in church. And you can learn a whole lot in Sunday school. Like a boy learned something down there just last Sunday. The Sunday school teacher asked me, she said, Mike, how far is it from Dan to Beersheba? I said, I don't know, ma'am. And Delmer Joe, a friend of mine, stood up right behind me. He said, you mean that Dan and Beersheba is places instead of people? I said, well, yeah, Delmer, even I need that. He said, well, you could have fooled me. I thought there's man and wife like Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> oh, there's more. <laughs> Me and Delmer used to sit together in the back of the church, cut up and was little. And one Sunday morning, the church had invited this great big old gal to come in and sing the Sunday morning special. And Mama buried down on the piano, and that gal got out in the middle of the floor and started singing. She was hitting all them high notes, and I thought to myself, that's got to be the most beautiful voice I've ever heard. And being from a musical family, I can appreciate somebody and hit all them notes. I said, damn her, that old gal has really got a large repertoire, don't she? <laughs> he said, he said, she sure does, and that dress she's got on makes it look worse. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any preachers here with us tonight? I've got a whole lot of respect for preachers because I know they have a lot on them to get up every Sunday and come up with a new sermon. And I know that sometimes them sermons don't work. Our preacher got up one Sunday and said, if a church is going to grow and prosper, it's got to first learn how to crawl. Amen. Come from over here. He said, after a church learns how to crawl, if it's going to grow and prosper, it's then got to learn how to walk. Amen, come from over here. Make it walk, come from over here. <laughs> and after a church learns how to walk, if it's going to grow and get bigger and better, it's then got to learn how to run. Amen, come from over here. Make it run, come from over here. People were foaming at the mouth. He said, if a church is going to run, it's got to have money. And a hush just fell across the congregation. <laughs> and a little weak boy from the back said, Let it crawl. <laughs> that made the preacher about half mad. He said, All right. I know that one of you men out here in the congregation today has been slipping around and flirting with another man's wife. And if you don't put $5 in the collection plate, I'm going to announce your name from the pulpit. Well, when the collection plates come around, it was 19 $5 bills and a note laying in there that said, here's $2, I'll give you the other three on payday. <laughs> When I get geared up here, we're going to do one called Chicken Necks and Wings. I'm going to sing. Oh, I know. <laughs> sing a whole lot like a prisoner. I'm behind eight bars and always looking for the key. I was going to learn how to sing one time. I got back there in the back bedroom and got the guitar out. And I was singing along, and the dog was in the room, and we got to howling. And Mama come in there and opened up the door and looked. And shut the door and went on back by the business. And I started singing again, and the dog started howling again. <laughs> Finally, Mama come back in there and opened up the door and said, Mike, can't you sing something that that dog don't know? <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's now 
Now we had family get-togethers back when I was just a lad. We'd finish the milking early and then we'd dress the best we had. After mom had fried the chicken and we combed and brushed her hair. We'd load up in that truck and off the grannies we would tear. Now at Granny's house, there wasn't much room for a little bitty fella to stand Cause the folks was laughing loud and slapping backs and shaking hands So I'd slip off with my cousins till it's time to say the grace When Uncle I could say the blessing, then us children take our place We sat at the second table eating chicken necks and wings A leftover dab of gravy in the fat back from the beans Fresh peach cobbler without peaches Melted ice cream from the churn Wasn't very much to choose from Once some grown-ups had their turn Black piano stool And I could hear them grown-ups talking Way off in the other room The ladies are swapping gossip Between each bite and happy side Uncle Bill, he'd tell a joke And they just laughed until they cried Old Aunt Myrtle kept complaining About them new shoes on her feet And all the men, they just bragging About the good things they had to eat how their plates all needed sideboards Cause the food is piles so high I just sat over there in the corner Wishing I had a breast or thigh We sat at the second table Eating chicken necks and wings A leftover down the gravy And the fat back from the beans Fresh peach cobbler without peaches Melted ice cream from the churn Wasn't very much to choose from Once some grown-ups had their turn wasn't very much to choose from once some grown-ups had their turn. All right. I sure appreciate that. Y'all are a good audience, ain't you? Yeah. Yeah. Huge, yeah. We're going to do one for you now called the Hamilton County Breakdown. I mean, this is fast. JT, what you got? BMW car needs to be moved from Buddy's restaurant next door. Boy, if that was mine, I'd be getting it out of the way. <laughs> Buddy's got a bat back there he keeps in the closet. <laughs> Get that off my... That blame card, I can't read. <laughs> All right. Here we go. This is called a Hamilton County Breakdown. One, two, three.
Me and Sweetie, that's my wife, we decided we'd move up here to Nashville and try out the big city living. Didn't take us but about four months to find out that we wasn't city dogs and we went on back to the house. <laughs> but while we was up here, I learned a whole lot of things. I found out that people in the big city don't wave at you like they do in the country. Fact about it is, when they waved at me, they didn't use their whole hand. <laughs> <laughs> the picking engagements wasn't coming in like I thought they was going to, and we got financially embarrassed. <laughs> Fact about it is, we was broke. <laughs> we got down so poor that a burglar broke in and we mugged him. <laughs> I told Sweetie, I said, I'm going down to the bank tomorrow and see if I can't get us up some money. So I went down the next day to the bank and walked in there and seen this little gal standing there. I said, where's the loan officer at? She pointed me over there in the corner and I went around the corner and went in this office and there was a man sitting at his desk. And I noticed he had his name on top of his desk. It's Dexter Cobb was his name. I said, Mr. Cobb, how you doing, old boy? He just sat there like a nod on the log. I said, you don't reckon maybe you might could loan me and my wife enough money to sort of tide us over till we could get us some credit cards, do you? <laughs> he got up out of that chair and looked at me and said, you're from the country, aren't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, do you know what we do with hicks in the city? I said, no, but I know what we do with cobs in the country. <laughs> We're going to do Salt Creek for you now. This is a pretty old song. What, didn't Bill write this one, Bobby? Bill Monroe, the father of bluegrass music. That's bar down on it. <laughs>
Okay, we're going to do one now that y'all ain't heard yet. Has any of y'all out there got a satellite dish? This is about an old boy that gets a satellite dish, and he has a pretty good time with it, and he gets himself in trouble a little bit. This is called the TV Satellite Blues. I got this out on a single. It's going to come out on the radio, or it already is out, so y'all call your local stations. Well, it's Friday night, and I slopped the hogs, so I went to the house, and I fed my dogs, and I went inside to relax and watch TV. I was flipping through the channels, hoping to catch an old western movie or a wrestling match, but all I could get was the news on Channel 3. So I picked up the paper and I saw this ad, and it went on and on how the latest fad could satisfy my ever-dreaming wish. It had a toll-free number that a man could call for a two-week trial, no charge at all. I could watch TV on my very own satellite dish. Well, a truck pulled up the very next morning and looked like it had a flying saucer on it. From a sign on the door, I could see it was Satellite Joe. He pulled out a commas, looked north and south, and he run a bunch of cables up into my house, and by the end of the day, she was wired and ready to go. But before Joe left, he reached in his coat and he pulled out a book and a little remote and said, now this contains everything that you need to know. Now, if you have any questions, just call on me. Here's my card to call toll free. Then he got in his truck and he drove off down the road. Well, I was mighty proud of my newfound toy, so I got on the phone and called Virgil and Roy and said, Y'all come on over and bring some tater chips. Sweetie just left to go play cards, and I got a satellite dish to yard. Well, we got all night to watch these movie clips. The first button I hit said Galaxy One. I could tell this was going to be a whole lot of fun while well, there was 24 channels on that satellite alone. There was Showtime, Cinemax, and HBO, saw a cartoon movie, and the rodeo. Well, we couldn't get over what all was going on. Satellite, satellite, I watch it all day and I watch it all night. If it's a football game, the movies or the fights, I ain't get the world on my satellite. Satellite. across the sky and I locked her down on West Star 5. Nurse had a man with a beard and a funny hat. The name of the show was The Doctor's Inn. He's talking about religion, politics, and sin, but I tell you, I think he's wanting money and things like that. Well, he's looking for gun smoke with Chester and Matt or the honeymooners with Norton and Ralph when somehow we wound up on Tell Star 3. <laughs> And there they was, like peas in a pod. There's five or six people in a great big wad while they're doing things you just don't see on regular TV. Well, there's people running around in their birthday suits. I tell you what, though, one of them looked pretty cute. Hoss would beat anything I'd ever seen before. I said, boys, let's move this dish over and hutch. This stuff here just ain't fit to watch. And about that time, I heard somebody at the door. It was my wife that had just walked in, and she was madder an old wet hen when she saw what we was watching on our TV. I'm telling you, she reached in the closet and grabbed the bat, and the boys hit the door like two scalded cats, and I ain't even going to tell you what she done to me. Satellite, satellite, I watch it all day and I watch it all night. If it's a football game, the moves or the fights, I get the world on my satellite. Satellite. This satellite dish is nice, ain't it, sweetie? Of course, I could see it a whole lot better if my eyes wasn't swelled shut. I didn't mean to watch it. Virgil made me do it. Boy, you hit me a Joe daughter of that ball bat, you know? Mm. I'll be sore for a week. Let's watch your TV, sweetie. Look, there's Lawrence Welk. Jerry Falwell and there's Jim Baker. Well, I see that good stuff on here, too. <laughs> ah, this satellite dish is happening, you know what I mean.
thank all of you for coming. I love each and every one of you. I appreciate your support. We're going to play the Foggy Mountain Breakdown and get on out of here.